Hi. In this video, I'm going to explain how I conceptualize hypermobility and dysautonomia, and how I make decisions about my health management strategy. I try to take a pragmatic approach to my health, meaning I'm focused on results, and I want to improve my baseline metrics for health and address the various issues in the most uh, fundamental and effective way as possible. So the core issues for me are hypermobility and being prone to dysautonomia, which results in things like disrupted sleep, GI issues, and more pot-specific stuff like lightheadedness when standing. Uh, these various issues contribute to each other. For example, injuries cause pain, which disrupts sleep. Disrupted sleep impairs your ability to recover from those injuries. Um, poor sleep also messes with your hormones, which causes more problems. For example, growth hormone stimulates collagen synthesis. So chronic sleep deprivation is going to weaken connective tissue and contribute to instability and injuries. Sleep also has interesting effects on movement patterns. They studied how participants executed uh, box jumps after inadequate sleep, and they were more prone to injury due to different movement patterns. It seems proprioception and fine motor control are affected by sleep problems. Obviously, staggering around and accumulating injuries is problematic. Dysautonomia also often results in GI issues like gastroparesis. On its own, this could impair absorption of nutrients and cause SIBO. Uh, it can also result in suboptimal eating patterns. Most folks with gastroparesis prefer snacking and small meals, which is valid. Uh, I took that approach for a while as well. But snack foods are generally less nutritious, and studies suggest that eating meals with 25 grams of protein without snacks in between initiates muscle protein synthesis more effectively, which supports recovery and adaptation from training. Some nutritional deficiencies, like thiamine, can cause dysautonomia also, uh, but the more likely issue is impaired recovery and adaptation from training. If you're not getting adequate protein, it'll predispose you to losing lean muscle mass and gaining fat as well. Finally, orthostatic dizziness and brain fog associated with POTS make exercise a grueling and potentially dangerous affair, and avoiding exercise could lead to deconditioning. I don't think deconditioning is the cause of most POTS cases, but many people report the period of inactivity due to injuries or life events contributed to a downward spiral of symptoms. It's easy to see how inactivity would reduce muscle tone and contribute to more injuries. I should add that this is all just based on my experience. I'm not a doctor. I don't claim to have the worst case of hypermobility or dysautonomia. I'm not diagnosed with EDS. Um, I'm just sharing what's worked for me uh, because I see, see a lot of people, you know, looking for management strategies and trying to piece it together themselves, and I just wanted to offer what's worked for me. Um, I could include more symptoms, but I think you can see these various issues create feedback loops um, and can cause it like a downward spiral, and I think this does a fair job of explaining how I conceptualize my health situation. I'm going to start with hormones, peptides, and other strategies for improving healing. There's a peptide called BPC-157, which promotes healing and connective tissue, and I found it remarkably helpful. Peptides are sequences of amino acids that your body uses to communicate and regulate various processes. BPC-157 was originally found in a natural peptide in the intestine, where it helps keep up with rapid cell turnover. They synthesized it and found that it helps with wound healing. Harry, you're getting so big. Ugh. This is Harry. They synthesized it and found that it helps with wound healing, tendon and ligament repair, and a variety of other processes within, when injected at higher doses. It does this by upregulating growth hormone receptors in connective tissue, making them more receptive to the healing effects of growth hormone. But it also promotes angiogenesis, which helps deliver nutrients and oxygen to tissues, especially those that don't have much vasculature, like connective tissue. There may be other mechanisms as well. Uh, this is a new compound and studies are ongoing. Like I said, I found BPC-157 incredibly helpful. I started bouncing back from injuries faster. My connective tissue began, began adapting to training much better. It helped significantly with GI issues like nausea and my sleep improved. The most surprising effect was on my more subtle dysautonomia symptoms. It largely resolved uh, my lightheadedness when standing 
and address the other issues like light sensitivity. I was resigned to getting headaches on bright days, but it's actually rarely an issue anymore, and I actually like skipping my sunglasses on my morning walks to reinforce my circadian rhythm. BPC-157 is typically injected with an insulin syringe into subcutaneous fat. This, this delivers some of the compound into the bloodstream and has systemic effects. There is more local effect, however, so injecting near the site of an injury can be helpful. The typical dose is 250 micrograms, and it's generally injected twice a day due to its short half-life. It can be taken orally, which has some benefit for GI issues, but less systemic effect. There's a new stable version of BPC-157 sold as BPC in the United States. They added a couple amino acids to the sequence, which improves stability. The original is very vulnerable to UV light, mechanical damage, and heat, and it, and it does break down in gastric juice eventually. The stable version addresses these issues and may be especially appropriate if you elect to administer it orally. You could certainly discuss BPC-157 with your doctor, but it's a new compound and it's unlikely they're familiar with it. If you can find a compounding pharmacy, such as tailor-made compounding, they could accept a prescription. Alternatively, it is available online without a prescription due to athletes seeking rapid recovery from injuries. Some of the sources may not be reputable, however, and it won't be labeled for human consumption. Uh, check out the description of this video for links on various topics. The next compounds I'm going to talk about elevate your growth hormone levels. They do this by compelling your body to release its own natural growth hormone. When you're young, uh, your growth hormone is released in pulses that saturate the body. But as we age, we still produce growth hormone, but it tends to trickle out. Because there are various binding proteins in the blood that inactivate growth hormone, the trickle of growth hormone uh, can't reach the tissues that would benefit from it. So first up is ipamorelin paired with mod GRF. These are injected together, and the result is a single pulse of growth hormone. Mod GRF is also known as CJC-1295 without DAC. DAC is a drug affinity complex that extends the half-life. Because we're seeking a pulse of growth hormone, the short half-life is actually more appropriate. The ipamorelin actually induces the release of growth hormone, but the mod GRF significantly increases the effectiveness by recruiting more cells to participate in the pulse. This can cause a head rush when administered, so um, you definitely want to be careful if you're prone to lightheadedness. Another option, which doesn't require injection, is a compound called MK677. This is a ghrelin mimetic, and as a result, it can make you hungry. So if you're trying to lose fat, this would make it difficult to adhere to a calorie restriction. It's cheaper, however, doesn't require injection, and has a longer lasting effect. But ipamorelin and mod GRF do have a longer track record of safety, and can be prescribed by life extension clinics or groovy doctors. MK677, on the other hand, is still in clinical trials, as far as I know, and is mostly used by athletes willing to push boundaries. There are other uh, peptides of interest, such as TB500, which assists in muscle repair. I did a por partial course and found it uh, cleared lingering injuries and reduced muscle spasticity. But someone mentioned experiencing a problematic increase in hypermobility to me, so tread carefully. Uh, GHKC Copper, GHK Copper um, is another one that improves healing and supports connective tissue. It's difficult to find what uh, protocols for how much to use, though. And there are peptides associated with various tissues and uh, organs, like pinealon, thymolin, and epithalon. So if you have the cash, um, you could promote healing in a variety of tissues and organs. Um, going back to growth hormone, though, the reason this is effective is because growth hormone is the main driver of collagen production. So if you have a genetic problem with your collagen and it's low quality, you can compensate for that low quality with higher quantities. This uh, collagen production happens throughout the body, including the structural components of muscles, tendons, ligaments, everywhere. Um, so, and also growth hormone really improves the effectiveness of BPC-157 because BPC-157 makes your connective tissue more receptive to growth hormone and then growth hormone kind of comes in and does the heavy lifting. 
If you want an additional boost, you could look into anabolic compounds such as Anavar or Osterine. They've been developing SARMs, which are selective androgen receptor modulators, which I, theoretically deliver the anabolic effects of testosterone with little or no androgenic effects. This could be especially beneficial for women who don't have natural testosterone levels to pro promote lean muscle mass. I've seen some women with EDS who were prescribed Anavar and reported good results. Anovar in particular is known to be, have very little androgenic effects like lowering voice and increasing body hair. Next up is GI issues. I'll just cover some concepts quickly I try to apply, but in general I think eating whole foods rather than those that are heavily processed or refined is beneficial. Consuming calories in absence of nutrients is effectively putting yourself in nutritional debt. So basically don't eat garbage um, like soda and crackers. Um, I know it's quite popular, but Gatorade I don't think supports your health, and its electrolyte content is mediocre. Anyway, um, I'd suggest getting at least 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, but 1 gram per pound of body weight is a good goal. So getting some protein isolate powder and making sure you hit your daily goal is a good start. I use truenutrition.com, but there are plenty of good options. Just make sure it's not loaded with carbs. A lot of protein powders are actually pretty sugary. The only other supplement um, I really like or might endorse is called hydroxy beta methyl butyrate or HMB, which may prevent breakdown of muscle in a catabolic state. The studies are mixed, but I thought it helped with muscle soreness and I bought a bunch of it in bulk and I added it to my protein shakes. Um, but like I said, the studies aren't super strong on it, so maybe it's just a placebo effect. I used to eat small meals and do a lot of snacking because I felt horrible after big meals but the studies suggest that it isn't optimal for adapting for training. Meals with at least 20 to 25 grams of protein are much more effective at stimulating muscle protein synthesis than trickling in the same amount of nutrition over time. There also seems to be a refractory period after you initiate muscle protein synthesis during which your body isn't ready to initiate the process again. And meal timing is a really convoluted topic, but Barbell Medicine, who I consider a reputable source, their opinion is that having a meal every three to five hours um, with no snacks in between is probably ideal, because it seems that if you have a snack, say an hour after a meal, um, not only is your body not ready to initiate muscle protein synthesis, but it may actually um, extend the refractory period so you're not ready f when you get to your next meal either. Um, other people will say four hours is the minimum that you should space out your meals. Um, it's probably not a really crucial issue, but typically what I do is I start and end the day with a protein shake, and then I'll usually have two, maybe three solid meals in between. And I space them at least three hours apart, usually a bit more, it's probably uh, partially influenced by what you're eating. So for instance, a protein shake is probably gonna move through pretty quickly. Um, and I, my lunch is usually a burrito bowl with a bunch of beans, which are um, also gonna move through pretty quickly. Whereas if you're having you know, steamed chicken breast, that might take you know, four or five hours bef before it's done um, releasing amino acids into your bloodstream. I've also developed a strategy to address my gastroparesis, and not only is it effective short term, I really think it's restored some regularity to my autonomic nervous system. The reason I have gastroparesis isn't that I'm physically incapable of moving the food along, it's that my parasympathetic nervous system doesn't engage appropriately due to dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. However, I can deliberately engage it at appropriate times, sort of like a manual override. Not only does this move the food along, it gets the autonomic nervous system back into the habit of digesting your food after you eat it. The parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest processes, can detect the overall amount of light hitting your eyes and is encouraged by darkness. It can also detect vascular pressure and it's encouraged by laying down with your head level with your stomach. It can also detect CO2 levels and breathing, so slow deep breaths encourage it. Diaphragm breathing may also help physically move the food along. Putting all these together, the ideal way to send a clear message to your body that it's time to digest is to lay down with an eye mask and breathe deep and slow. Uh, it might be tempting to look at your phone, but complete darkness is key, I think. 
it's important to send a strong, unambiguous signal to your body. I find 15 to 20 minutes a good length uh, immediately after meals. You may get groggy if you go much beyond 20 minutes. Even as little as five minutes seem to have some benefit. Uh, I often have to go to the bathroom afterwards, which is a good sign that things are moving along. This may seem like a dumb trick, but I highly encourage you to try it. Your parasympathetic nervous system is crucial for repairing your body, digesting food, and adapting from workouts. And you just can't survive without it. I did this consistently after solid meals and sometimes protein shakes, and over time, my body started to react more appropriately, even if I didn't lie down. So now I can eat a big meal and go walk some dogs and my body is in the habit of engaging digestion without me holding its hand. Although I still get better results when I lay down after meals. Um, carrying on, I'm gonna talk about strength training to address unstable joints. Uh, first of all, you need to have recovery capacity in place before you ramp up training. So getting decent sleep and at least 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight per day is a good start. If you add exercise but don't have the capacity to recover, it'll only make things worse. My primary goal is to add muscle mass to strap down unstable joints. I also try to improve my strength, but adding lean mass has the best standby stabilizing effect, I think. You can't expect to consciously engage your subscapularis muscle all day, but if you cover your scapula with more muscle, it will, for example, reduce winging without conscious effort. Another benefit to training is to learn healthy movement patterns, things like hinging at the hips, picking things up off the floor, pushing, pulling, etc. Um, these all have great carryover to real world situations and can prevent injuries if you're acclimated to them. I also think resistance training is effective in sort of untraining the conditioned pain response you may have developed. I had extremely tight and painful hamstrings and lower back pain, for example, but it was largely because my body was bracing because I had injured myself previously. Uh, by starting light and gradually progressing, I was able to erode the neurological response that had developed and unlock the ranges that had previously been impossible. In particular, eccentric and isometric exercises were helpful for this. And in my opinion, I think static stretching is a steaming pile of garbage. I won't dwell too much on exercise, but the benefits are extraordinary. The one suggestion I'd offer is to focus on consistency. A lot of people report a pattern of injuring themselves and not being able to exercise for extended periods. Uh, so my primary goal was to stick to a schedule and cut back as much as necessary in individual workouts in order to keep showing up. I train at home, typically Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So on Monday, I'd go downstairs and lay out my equipment and start the warm-ups. At that point, I'd trust my judgment about what I could handle, but I'd make sure not to jeopardize coming back in a couple days. Even if I went, I, I even went intentionally very light for a while in order to establish consistency, just to show myself that showing up was the most important thing, even if I didn't get in a bunch of work. Because if you burn out and stop training, you won't get the results. Sleep has been a crucial ingredient in my recovery, and it's taken a lot of work. I was never a good sleeper, but lately I've been getting the best sleep of my life. Um, what I do is I block off a 12-hour period and dedicate it to getting a good night's sleep. Obviously, I don't sleep 12 hours, but everything in between, for example, 7 and 7 is intended to support my sleep. So at 7 p.m., I put on my blue blocking glasses. Blue light is disruptive to melatonin production, and it only takes a tiny bit of light to tank your melatonin. Then around maybe nine, I actually go to bed and I wear an eye mask that blocks all light. I also wear earplugs, which took some getting used to, but are great at blocking transient noises that might disrupt my sleep. I also wear a mouth guard because my jaw is crappy and slips out of place, causing pain and waking me up. I also take melatonin, but the blue blocking glasses I think are more effective. I sleep as long as I can and wake up naturally. And over time, if I'm waking up later than I like, I gradually move my bedtime a little bit earlier. I also try to maintain great sleep hygiene. I know the bed can be a nice place to hang out if you have chronic illness, but it's important for your brain to associate the bed with falling asleep. What I do is lay some blankets on the floor so I have some place to lay down during the day besides the bed. I'm especially vigilant about avoiding screens in bed. Although I'm not perfect about it. I don't, I don't claim to be perfectly consistent. 
The biggest factor though is consistency. Um, I had to get all the ingredients together and then give it time. Sticking, sticking to the same schedule all week is important. The goal is to send very clear signals to your body and establish healthy patterns. And then over time, they'll become habits and your body should do them automatically or more, more, more automatically. I did try to address my lightheadedness when standing more directly with mixed results. I did increasingly intense cardio exercises, such as sprinting up hills or intense swimming, and I succeeded in improving my cardiovascular fitness, but it didn't have much effect on the lightheadedness or brain fog. I also pursued inversion exercises to target my vascular system. I inverted myself against the wall so my body had to squeeze the blood of my, out of my head, and then I stood up and it had to squeeze it out of my lower body. I started out with brief attempts during workouts and then worked up to uh, cycling up and down for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and over time I acclimated to it. I definitely felt my vascular response when standing became more robust, but it didn't help with other dysautonomia symptoms like light sensitivity. The BPC-157 had a much bigger impact on those things. Now that I'm more comfortable with it, I have, I've actually started doing it every morning as part of my morning routine. My goal is to keep my vascular system in tip-top shape and to train it to deliver a functional amount of blood no matter what. Um, it's worth mentioning though, this could be dangerous for some people if you have any sort of compromised vasculature, and it's definitely something you should discuss with your doctor or physical therapist if you'd like to pursue it. That covers the basics of what I do for my health, uh, but I'll touch on a few miscellaneous topics. I definitely had to make general lifestyle changes to avoid stress and injury. Um, and personally, I reached a crisis point two or three years ago and ended up quitting my job, dropping all my hobbies, selling everything I owned, and moving in with friends and family. Um, I'd been trying to ignore my deteriorating health for years, and I finally realized that I had to make space for it in my life. So I resolved to focus on my health to the exclusion of everything else. I generally avoid going places and doing things, uh, but it's not as boring as it sounds. Now that I have a process to make myself better instead of worse, I really want to maintain it. I've also put a lot of work into posture, which has paid off in pain reduction. It really helps to make posture a high priority. Um, you have to keep bringing it to the forefront of your mind. So if you can dedicate a stretch of time where you're gonna make posture a really high priority, that works a lot better than just sort of thinking about it once in a while. Um, there are also exercises you can do, but um, mostly you just have to think about it a lot and have the right cues. Um, I found lifting my sternum helpful rather than pinching your shoulders back, actually lift your sternum. Um, I'll link a video down below from Athlean X that I found helpful. I've also had to make various rules for myself, like avoiding prolonged sitting or hunching over my phone. So if I want to look at my phone, for example, I lay down on the floor so my spine and neck are in healthy positions. And I generally avoid stimulants and alcohol. Stimulants incurs the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, which is catabolic. It liberates energy and uh, breaks things down. Um, alcohol used to give me migraines. Um, I'm not sure if it would anymore, but I've accepted that it's probably best to avoid anyways. And that's pretty much all I have to offer you. Um, I have a couple documents linked below. One is general info and strategies, which includes more info on peptides. There's another one on exercise with example workouts and links to various programs. And I hope this has been helpful, and I wish you the best.